Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I am back for November's coffee and questions, although it is matcha and questions. I'm trying to limit my caffeine intake, wish me luck. And so today I'm gonna be answering your questions from Instagram poll box question box thingy and from your comments on YouTube. I actually have not looked at your comments or your questions and so I am winging it today. I will let you know in the description box down below and I will chapter it all out with your questions that I end up answering for today. If you're curious, moral of the story is I'm gonna answer a whole lot of your questions from various outlets. And so before we do that, make sure you subscribe down below, give it a like, share it with a friend as usual and then let's get answering your questions. Happy almost holidays, everyone. It is right before Thanksgiving as I film this, and I feel like I'm already getting in the holiday cheer with my green and red. We are about to decorate for Christmas in like a day, and I am so excited about it. Who's excited about it with me? I'm gonna answer a bunch of your questions. Let's go over to Instagram, and I'm just gonna fly through as many as I can get to without being too long-winded. And I know I got a couple of DMs. If you're trying to get a hold of me and trying to get your question answered, the best chance is to follow me on Instagram and then wait towards the end of the of the month where I, I post a question box on my story, throw it in there. That's the best way. The second best way is comment box on this video. So I usually go back to the previous coffee and questions and go there first when I'm looking for questions, which I will do today from last month. And then last but not least, you can send me a DM, but I have to be honest, the DMs that I send, I always forget to look at when I'm actually in the moment answering your questions. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Let's get to your questions. RHI Foss says, if you don't tear with your first baby, what are the chances you will with your second? So stay tuned and subscribe down below because I have a preventing tearing video coming next week, likely. So in the next couple of weeks, it will be there. Um, if you didn't tear with your first baby, the chance of tearing with your second is also very low. Obviously it's gonna depend on position of the baby and the size of the baby and how fast or slow things go. But in general, you typically tear more with the first baby. And then a lot of times, if we're gonna see an intact perineum, meaning that like you don't tear at all, that's gonna happen with second, third, fourth, fifth babies. Those ones you sort of anticipate stretching a little bit easier because those tissues have been primed before. And so I would say your chance is very slim for tearing with your second baby. Okay, Jessica Ray 134 says, how to treat mastitis with a heart. Okay, so this deserves its own entire full video. If you have mastitis, you have to go see your doctor, okay? That is, that is so it, it is an infection. It can become very serious. It can turn into an abscess. You may need to be hospitalized. Like it's a serious thing. Now, most of the time they're gonna put you on antibiotics. You're drinking tons of fluid. You're doing heat on the, on the, the likely the swollen duct or the area that has the mastitis. You're feeding regularly, but not too much. All those things, Obviously I can put in another video. So if you want a video specifically for mastitis, let me know. But my number one recommendation is if you haven't seen your provider yet, see your provider and then get a lactation consultant involved. And that lactation person and your doctor together can come up with a care plan to best treat you. Because the worst case scenario is that you end up back in the hospital separated from your baby, it can just, and then it also can really influence your breastfeeding journey. A lot of people stop breastfeeding due to mastitis. So we wanna prevent that as much as possible, which is why prevention is key for mastitis. So we wanna watch out for those clogged milk ducts, massage, massage. If you're having pain specifically in one area, you wanna feed, feed, feed. Obviously not too much because you don't want to overstim. This is not a video for that, but let me know if you want one on clogged milk ducts because I can do that too. And then massage it out. And the other thing you can take is sunflower lex lecithin. Master Bader says, I desire a VBAC 2C, so a VBAC 2C, um, which is a VBAC vaginal birth after two cesareans. Tell me I'm not insane. The previous C-section times two for non-reassuring fetal heart rate. I would say you are absolutely not insane for wanting that vaginal birth, especially if your first C-section felt like a loss or your second then felt like even more of a loss. I would say, in fact, I would say that you're entirely normal and I would probably feel the same way. So I feel you on that. Now, is there a, way, a place in the world where people have VBACs after meaning vaginal births after two cesareans? 
Absolutely, I've seen it before. Now, are you at increased risk of uterine rupture? This is where you take my, my VBAC class if you haven't already. I have an entire class there for you and I also have two YouTube videos on VBAC. You can check out, just search in the searchy bar thing on my channel for VBAC, V-A-C. Um, but you're not crazy and it happens all the time and it can be done safely so long as you understand the risks. So that to me is totally up to you, but it absolutely is a potential. You, have to, you also have to find a provider that's willing to do it. Hayden Kissel says, what interventions are appropriate for IUGR, especially if the baby is otherwise healthy? I love this question. So I probably should do an entire video on IUGR as well. All of these could probably be their own video, but the long of the short, once again, is what is IUGR? Intrauterine growth restriction, meaning the baby is not growing adequately or it's not within a normal weight gain for the gestational age or the age of the pregnancy. And so I love this because I think we think, oh, my baby's just small. Whereas that is true. Yes, your baby is small, but the idea is that the baby's growth is a reflection of how healthy the placenta is. And the placenta is your baby's lifeline. We want your placenta giving blood, meaning which carries nutrients to your baby to make your baby grow. If your baby stops growing, then there's no reason your baby needs to stay inside because it's not getting the nutrients that it needs. What happens when babies don't get nutrients that they need? They're not growing and eventually, like if we were to not eat for a long time and or that also could indicate oxygen flow to the baby, depending on what's happening with the placenta, it can actually be serious, right? That like you think about, we don't get nutrients or oxygen, what happens? Okay, and I'm not saying that's likely gonna happen, but that's why you're going to your prenatal visits and you're getting ultrasounds and or they're watching the growth of the baby because we want you growing. That's an indication the placenta is working. So your baby may be otherwise healthy, but if they're not growing, that's actually concerning that your baby's not healthy, okay? Because of that placenta. So what was the question? <laughs> On. What are the interventions that are appropriate for IUGR? Most of the time, if your baby, they're gonna watch it because we wanna get you to that 37 week mark, ideally 35 if we can't make it to 37 for the sake of the lung maturity. And then they'd likely give you some steroids to help mature their lungs if you're younger than 37 weeks. Flex and flow on that one. And then you're probably looking at an induction of labor because otherwise we keep waiting and that, that placenta is not gonna get any better function throughout your pregnancy. It peaks at 37 weeks. After that, it's like, meh, I did my job. Okay, so we care, it does matter, and you're probably looking at an induction. S.L. Garcia says, postnatals for the postpartum stage. This is like a vitamin. Doctor recommended not to take iron. Why so? So I usually say, and this is where you always wanna check with your provider and ask them what they want you to do based on your own personal person and your own history. Um, one, your, your hemoglobin may have been high, so that's therefore they may have been like, don't do iron. Um, the other thing for iron is it can make you constipated. So especially if you had a C-section, it's just worse to feel constipated after everything else. Um, and if you're eating normally, like in general, we don't need to take iron and you're not pregnant anymore, so you don't really need to take iron anymore. Um, now, if you had a huge blood loss, like you hemorrhaged at your birth, then you, they might recommend putting you on iron, but I don't think it's standard to put you on iron afterwards. What I usually say is just keep taking your prenatal vitamin. I love ritual vitamins. I take them myself. They're linked down below with a promo code if you want some. Um, and then they go into a like women's vitamin. But if you're breastfeeding, they say to keep taking your prenatal vitamin. So postnatals, yes, keep taking your vitamins. And why didn't they want you to be on iron? Because you're not pregnant anymore and because you don't need it. Lots of tearing questions today. All right, Christina Beverly 20 says, after a third degree tear, is it recommended to have a C-section with the second pregnancy? Okay, so this is totally a flex and flow situation. I know people that after a third or a fourth degree tear, they are like, I will never go through that again down there. And so yes, I want a C-section. Is it appropriate, meaning you can't have a vaginal birth? Absolutely not. And so this is where I would send you to my risks of a C-section video where I weigh the risks of a vaginal birth versus a C-section because by having a C-section, especially with it being your first surgery, you're taking on all the risks of surgery. 
And so that compared to the risk of a third degree or a fourth degree tear again, and what did I say with our very first question was, if you tore the first time, you're more likely to not tear the second, third, fourth one. So what if you have an entirely intact vagina slash perineum, it's really your perineum versus your vagina, and you deliver vaginally and you avoid a C-section? You don't know until you try. So in general, no, it is not recommended from my from my knowledge. Maybe with a fourth degree tear, they may discuss and counsel and give you the choice. Ultimately, everything is your choice, but it is if somebody's giving you a hard stop on that one, then I would say absolutely not. You get to do whatever you want and it's not contraindicated for a vaginal birth. Stephanie Goodwall says, is there a correlation between Pitocin induction and drops in blood pressure? Okay, so um, Pitocin, by the way, is the medication we give you in an induction to help with contractions. I talk about my, it in my labor induction videos and I also talk about it in my labor, uh, in my medical interventions class slash childbirth bundle, you can see down below. So um, in general, no. The rate of Pitocin we give for Pitocin induction is so slow that it should not affect your blood pressure. If you had effects in your blood pressure that was probably due to something else, my guess would be you got an epidural. That would be usually where the reason why we see drops in blood pressure during people's labors. Um, oh, this is a good one too. Mariah Jewell says, have you ever seen a postdural puncture headache from an epidural happen? It happened to her. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, typically we don't see them until postpartum. So I'd usually not see them in labor and delivery. Sometimes you'd suspect it and you're like, mm, or you'd watch the epidural placement and go, mm, I wonder about that one. Otherwise I would see them in postpartum when I floated to postpartum or when I followed up with patients in postpartum now, or I'd heard about it from my personal clients in the last few years. It is pretty rare, honestly. I've seen a handful. I've helped with the epidural blood patch, which is the procedure they do to fix it. Um, so yes, I've seen it. What it is, a postdural headache, is where the cerebral spinal fluid actually leaks into the epidural space, causing a decrease in space around your brain. So our brains are free floating in my head. Like when I do that, I kind of get dizzy, but I don't have a headache when I do that, right? And it kind of, you kind of almost like feel like a, like there's like movement, there's like water around my head in here so that my brain doesn't bang against my skull, right? That like it allows for it to like, <laughs> blob around, right? And so you need that space around your head slash your brain so that you don't, so that you have that movement of your brain in the head. I hope that makes sense. Okay, now when the epidural, the cerebral spinal fluid from the epidural leaks into the epidural space, you have less of that fluid. So then you sit up and you're like, oh my God, my head hurts so bad. But then you lay down and you let it kind of float flat and there's no like pressure changes because of gravity, then you don't have a headache anymore. And so if you do have this, it's not the end of the world. It will likely resolve within about two weeks, which sucks because a two week headache is like miserable. I had one yesterday after my booster shot and holy moly, I just was so over it. Now the fix is that epidural blood patch where they basically do the epidural procedure again. They don't actually do the same process, but they inject your blood into the epidural space and it naturally clots off the area and it's an instant fix in your headache. So it's annoying, it's definitely a procedure, one more needle in your back, but ultimately I usually recommend it because it's like you feel so much better. This is sad. Lex. I'm not gonna name the numbers, um, just says, what can a patient do if they feel their doctor botched their delivery? Oh my God, I just feel so much for you. Um, well, first of all, I would wanna know what you mean by botched because was it a vaginal birth? Was it a C-section? Are we talking incision? Are we talking tearing? Are we talking bedside manner? Um, so I would need to know a little bit more, but I would, honestly, and I don't know if this feels comfortable to you or not, and I know certain providers are much more approachable than others, but I would go back to your provider and say, can you talk to me about what happened? I feel blank, fill in the blank, and I have questions about this, fill in the blank. And that may help understand what went on. Um, now, if you truly feel like there was negligence or abuse or assault, or that it really was that bad. Um, and no matter what level of that, it's still bad if it affects your mental health and auto automatically I read this and I'm like, mm. so I care and it matters. Um, but there would be a time and a place where you could request your medical records, you could look for a personal injury attorney, 
and kind of go from there. So I would need to know a little bit more information to be able to help you on that one, but I'm so sorry you feel that way. And of course, I'm gonna encourage you first to try to talk to your provider. And I know that can feel intimidating and I know sometimes they don't receive it as well, but you don't know till you try. And sometimes you may actually find that they're a lot more approachable than you think. I know doctors can kind of be scary sometimes. I'm even scared of doctors sometimes. And so then, but once you talk to them, you're like, oh my gosh, they actually care, they're human. And automatically you have a little bit of healing in that way. The Captain H. Nemo says, after the nurse takes out the epidural catheter, so many epidural questions today too, do they have to put a Band-Aid or something over it? The answer is yes, we actually put a Band-Aid over it. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little hole. And in fact, I have a really cool removing the epidural, I don't know if you think it's cool, but I think it's really cool, a video where they're removing the epidural catheter and you can like see it come out and then they just plop it on. It's the tiniest little hole, you don't feel a thing. It sounds worse than it is, but I do have a video on Instagram if you wanna check that out. Jen Gill 17 says, I had such a great delivery with my first, that's what we wanna hear. Um, what are the chances of this pregnancy to be the same? I would say, hi. <laughs> I mean, obviously flex and flow, there's so many things that could go differently each time, but in general, if it went the good the first time, most of the time it's gonna go somewhat similar. Obviously, always different, flex and flow on that one, but definitely similar, so I'm gonna go for same. Mrs. Sarah Harrison says, my baby is nine months old, loving solids, but not wanting to nurse as much. Is this normal? Yes, this is totally normal, especially once you start introducing solids, their palate is gonna change, and they a lot of times will naturally wean themselves off of breast milk. Now, if you still have breast milk, you wanna pump, you still wanna give them the nutrients, you can always pump and then start introducing it into some of their solid food and like their soups or their oatmeal or whatever they're having so that they still get some of that those nutrients, but absolutely it's normal. Once you start introducing solids, some babies wean early, some babies want the boob forever, um, but it sounds like your baby is just developmentally appropriate and weaning itself slowly off the breast. Mm. Christina Volenurman says, how can I prevent excess gas buildup after a C-section? Any tips for handling the pain? So by gas buildup, yes, we're talking about like gas, like in the normal sense of the word, but sometimes that also can be like a shoulder pain and that shoulder pain is technically gas too. So I'm gonna say any excess air in the abdomen, whether that be in your digestive system or actually in your abdomen from being open and air getting trapped inside. So first and foremost, you gotta be on your medication. If you just had surgery, no one needs to feel that pain, all right? Personal opinion, but please don't be a martyr, all right? You deserve to have pain medication to help you, all right? You wanna be taking your pain medication around the clock until, and I would say around the clock for probably a week, maybe five days after that, sort of like maybe start to transition. And mind you, that by pain medication, we're talking Motrin Tylenol, okay? Not, not like strong painkillers, although sometimes strong painkillers, to start off and then wean into that Motrin. The other thing for a C-section is, please be taking your Colace, which is your stool softener. It is not a laxative, but you did get narcotics in the surgery likely or in postpartum, and so we wanna prevent constipation. We wanna get that digestive system going and then my third tip for you is that you gotta get up and moving. And I know after a surgery, it is the most terrifying thing in the world to be like, wait, I'm sorry, you want me out of bed at six hours, 12 hours, what? I just had surgery. Yes, we do. And it's partially for the gas, that that gas, any kind of movement, ambulation we call it, or walking. And this isn't like jogging around the block. This is like walk to the bathroom, like linger around your room, get up and moving and sort of like get things shifting. That'll help to absorb some of that gas. And then it also will help to kind of prime your system and help to heal your wound and get you healthy faster. Jas Kaka, which I definitely said that wrong and I apologize, says, why do some women not go into active labor? What causes this? Honestly, we don't know. Um, 
my hypothesis and a strong hypothesis that I could back with science is probably that the baby never engages in the pelvis, which is why I have an entire engage the baby video an entire positions in labor video coming. So make sure you subscribe down below why I have a birth ball video coming subscribe down below as well for that. Um, because all of those things, we gotta get the baby with pressure on the cervix. That's going to send hormonal signal to the brain, more contractions, stronger, lower into the pelvis baby, hopefully. Okay, so I'm gonna head over to YouTube comments. I only have a few questions from there and then we will end this month's coffee and questions. But if you have other questions, make sure you comment down below and I may see them for December's coffee and questions. I also have a surprise coming in December's coffee and questions. So make sure you subscribe down below because I have something fun for you there. All right, so Mrs. Bobber says, I love the bundle birth tumbler. You saw that in my last video. Do you have merch? The answer is sort of, <laughs> yes. Okay, so if you follow me on Instagram, sometimes I will post shirt campaigns. We use Bonfire, so it's like a two to three week campaign where we have merch available. Maybe you've seen me in my Flex and Flow shirt. We are working on getting those in the store. We've sort of focused on bundle birth nurses because we've had like so much growth on the bundle birth nurses side for the last year. But right now you can head to bundlebirth.com slash shop and we have so many fun new products in there. There's pens, there's some super cute stickers, such fun nurse gift ideas over there. There's a position guide that can help with your labor. There's labor massage guide. There's a labor warm up. all sorts of tools to help you with your labor and or, and then I'd say leave with your nurse because we want these nurses also kind of getting on board on the same page, helping you and help uh, helping others to have positive birth experiences. Okay. So the answer is yes. And I will link everything down below. All right. Neem Rahim says, hi, Sarah, quick question. If our oxytocin level is that the highest right after birth, why is the Pitocin so routinely introduced? Um, Okay, and then also how long do we, are we usually allowed to, or we should wait before proceeding with the Pitocin to avoid postpartum hemorrhage? Thank you in advance. Okay, two part question. First one is why is Pitocin so routinely introduced? Because hemorrhage is the number one reason of, of mortality worldwide in the immediate postpartum period. We are worried about you dying from blood loss, okay? As your medical people, we are watching for that. Now, the chance of that, especially in the United States, I would say is on the slim side, but as a precaution, it's like risk benefit, losing too much blood and dying versus giving you some Pitocin postpartum, that's where ACOG's gonna make that decision, okay? So that's the reason why. Now. Also, how long are we usually allowed to or should wait before we proceed with Pitocin? This, I would say, is where we can control what we can and then we sort of have to go let, let go of the rest because you have an expert medical provider that is watching your vagina or your C-section incision and looking at the blood loss. You have anesthesiologists there, you have experts watching this. And so if this is something you're like, I wanna avoid postpartum Pitocin, but then at, at certain point, like of course I don't want it causing too much harm or whatever, that's totally your decision. But at some point, your provider may, and they should make a recommendation, look, I'm seeing too much blood loss. I think you need postpartum Pitocin. And then that's where my recommendation would be that you go, okay, thank you for your expertise. Absolutely, you're here to save my life. I'm down, <laughs> okay? Versus being like, well, how much doctor? Well, blah, blah, blah. Like at some point, I wanna empower you with the education and the support to make informed choices but also that doesn't take away the expertise of your doctor or midwife that is there helping to keep you safe. And we have protocols in place. We do things because we have science to back it. And while there is some of that shift in culture that needs to take place, where like things may still be kind of old school practice, overall we have to trust in those providers that they're there because they wanna keep you safe, okay? So if they're making a recommendation, concerned about blood loss, I'm gonna say that's when we say, thank you so much. Yes, of course, please save my life. <laughs> Monica MCS says, how long can cord clamping be delayed? What is considered too long? Great question. So I have an entire video on delayed cord clamping you can check out so you can learn more about that. In general, how long is up to you? So some people actually wait for the placenta to be delivered and then wait until the cord falls off until they remove the 
cord from the baby. So like days, weeks, potentially, <laughs> okay? Now, once there's no more blood flow to the baby, there really isn't medical benefit anymore, right? If we're trying to get a delayed cord clamping, ideally we're looking at 30 seconds to a minute, to three to five minutes plus, um, until it stops pulsating, but there really isn't harm, especially if you have access to treatment for jaundice, because that is probably the biggest risk if you leave the cord from to pulsate and give more blood to the baby. Um, but in general, there's really no number that's too long. And how long? It can be as long as you or your provider will allow for. I love this question. I'm gonna read it to you as a teaser for a future video into the future and hopefully help you subscribe down below because this one I think deserves, it's an entire video, but the question is, at what time is it appropriate to fight to not have a C-section? Obviously, if the baby is in distress, you do not you have to do what's safe for the baby, but I feel like there are times when I hear people say, I wasn't progressing, so we did a C-section. Is it okay to say no as long as the baby is safe? This is such a well-worded question, Angela. I am putting it on my short list for a future video, so make sure you subscribe down below so you don't miss that, okay? Thank you everyone for being with me here today. That is all I have time for, for this month's Coffee and Questions. But again, if you have one, throw it in the comment box down below. Tell me what you learned. Was there something that surprised you from this video? And then make sure you follow me over on Instagram, over at Bundle Birth. There's lots more going on over there. Make sure you subscribe down below. If you want more from me, you can head onto the description box. I have classes, I have support, there's PDF downloads, there's other fun things, promo codes, and all the fun things in the world. Down there in the description box for you to check out. And then I hope you found this video very helpful. I hope you learned something new. It's always so fun for me to be able to connect with you through this series, this monthly series that usually comes out the last day of the month or the first day of the month for the previous month. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye.